Okay. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining the second meeting of the online Geneva Trade and Development uh, Workshop, which is organized by uh, the CPR, the Geneva School of Economics and Management, the Graduate Institute Geneva, UNCTAD, and WTO. Before we start with the talk, a quick um, reminder of the, of the rules and of the plan for today. The speaker's presentation will last for one hour, and during that one hour, you can type your questions on the Q&A window. The co-hosts here today will collate them and we will pass them on to the speaker. After that first hour, we will have 15 minutes uh, for an open discussion, and you can participate by uh, using the raise hand button on the menu bar. With that uh, said, let me introduce today's speaker. We are very happy to have Paul Antras giving the seminar today. Paul is the Robert Giori Professor of Economics at Harvard, and he will be discussing joint work with Steve Redding and with Esteban Rossi Hansberg on globalization and pandemics. Uh, Paul, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much for being here, and the floor is yours for one hour. Thanks a lot, Julia. I hope everybody can hear me well. Um, it's a real pleasure to be uh, here today. Obviously, um, you know, it would have always, obviously would have been better to have been in Geneva uh, as I was scheduled to be a few months ago. Um, but, you know, I'm really grateful that, um, that you guys have put this together. It sounds like a great uh, series. So let me uh, share my screen. Um, uh, hopefully you can all see it. If not, let me know. Should be good. So, you know, one of the side effects of, uh, of the current situation is the paper that I'm going to give is a different paper than I was scheduled to give because it's a paper on pandemics, not something I was thinking about, uh, you know, nine months ago or so. Um, so this is joint work with Steve Redding, who's at Princeton, and Esteban Rossi Hansberg, who's also at Princeton. So it's a paper on globalization and uh, pandemics. It's maybe uh, going to touch upon some issues that have come up lately, but I want to stress that it's more of a broader uh, uh, paper that is trying to kind of think about some of the conceptual aspects that might link globalization and pandemics. So the starting point is that this, these are not two things that are uh, separate from each other. Globalization and pandemics have been closely uh, intertwined, intertwined in history. Um, so in the case of the Black Death, it's well known that it arrived in Europe around October of 1347, uh, when 12 ships from the Black Sea docked in, uh, in the port of uh, 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 Messina. And as a matter of fact, I mean, this is, uh, I guess, more known now, the word uh, quarantine comes from the Italian word quarantena, uh, which is a 40-day period of isolation that was required of ships when they, when they docked at the port. More recently, um, you know, it's also sort of, uh, been documented that a lot of the way that the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic sort of was spread across countries had very much to do with trade or international business. Okay, so in the case of Europe, I think uh, uh, today that it is believed that the first human to human uh, infection in Europe happened in Germany in Starnberg. And it was related to a car, a car producer, a car parts producer I had a supplier in, uh, in, um, in Wuhan and had brought in somebody from Wuhan for a, some sort of workshop. And that person sort of infected a bunch of people in Germany. And, uh, and that was sort of an initial uh, focus of infection. Closer to where I am here in Boston, there's a famous case of a biotech company uh, that had a conference here in Boston. And, and basically the, through the event, it, it led to kind of a big set of infections where six states in the US, the first infection in six states in the US have been linked to that biotech uh, conference uh, and more than 100 people in, in, in Massachusetts were infected uh, based on that. So there seems to be a link between, you know, globalization, carrying out of international trade, international business and the spread of globalization. Now that from a conceptual point of view, that's the question of how exactly do these things interrelate? It seems kind of obvious uh, and it probably wouldn't be a super interesting paper if this was obvious, that globalization um, makes societies more vulnerable to pandemics, that it increases the likelihood of pandemics and it, um, it might make them more severe than they would be without globalization. But we wanna put a question mark here, which is, is this so obvious? And if it's not so obvious under which circumstances this might not hold, okay? So just thinking about that, uh, we found ourselves uh, uh, learning stuff that was not exactly obvious to us. Uh, 
And then you might want to understand also not just how trade affects pandemics, but the reverse causality, which is how do pandemics affect trade? Both in the short run, as the pandemic is unfolding, what do we expect uh, trade flows to, how do we expect trade flows to react? Um, and more generally, I think there's a lot of demand to try to understand uh, what are going to be not the consequences in the next few months, but also for the future of globalization. Now, I should manage expectations and say we're going to have much more to say about the short effects rather than long run effects. Um, but there's something on the long run effects that we've learned in doing this that I think is interesting. And at least it provides some baseline uh, uh, that then we can think about um, how robust that, that insight is going to be. From a more technical point of view, in order to kind of link uh, globalization and pandemics, what, uh, what we had to do is develop a model of trade that was a bit more explicit about the extent to which trade transactions uh, are mediated or sort of require some sort of human to human interactions, okay? Because if everything was remote, then obviously you could carry out trade without the risk of this leading to more disease transmission. So we're gonna develop a very, very simple model that's gonna put, put human interactions at the center uh, of the model. Now that's gonna back a lot of questions and I'm gonna pause and ask for questions about, you know, how realistic is this? Or, you know, do you really think that it's all about human to human interactions? Are, isn't there heterogeneity between different types of activities that require more or less face-to-face uh, -face interactions? There's gonna be a bunch of extensions of the model that we could develop. We've developed a a handful of them. There's many more that could have been developed. I welcome uh, uh, suggestions and um, that might lead to kind of some discussion as to how robust the results are or how do, what would you need to make to the model to be more empirically palatable that you could take to the data more directly. So on the trade side, that's gonna be one part and I'm gonna pause after I tell you about the trade side of the model to see if there's any question. It's gonna be a simple model that has gonna have human to human, human interactions but that what's nice of it, I think, is that it's going to deliver a, a fairly standard gravity equation of trade. Okay. And then we're going to have to merge that with a model of disease transmission. And here we went with a standard canonical SIR model, which you probably have seen in, in a variety of ways in the last few months. Uh, and you'll see that it's basically there's going to be a nice fit between the two. And the two models are going to speak to each other. And a lot of the results that we're going to get are going to come from how these two sides of the model are going to speak to each other. Okay. So my plan is going to be to kind of uh, tell you about the trade side of the model, pause, tell you about the disease dynamics side of the model, pause, and then work through the results, maybe pause at some time uh, in the middle. Okay, so um, I think that's roughly my plan. Uh, if there's questions earlier, Julia or I can, can start gathering uh, them, but I think it's, it's better to kind of give you a bit of the model before I do uh, the first pause. Now, let me give you just a flavor, not to want to spend too much time on this, but to give you a flavor of some of the results that are going to come. So we're going to study this in three, in three steps in order to kind of, I think it's useful pedagogically and, um, and for us, it certainly was useful to kind of build insight to go slowly and sort of have different elements come. So even when you merge a trade model and a model of disease dynamics, and a first natural step perhaps is one, where you isolate the role of globalization or the degree of trade integration on pandemics, okay? If we wanna understand when pandemics emerge and how severe are they, what is the role of globalization? So you can isolate that link by having a version of the model uh, in which people are clueless. They just don't know what's going on. They're completely unaware that there's a, an infection going on. They carry on with life as usual uh, but obviously the pandemic is happening and it might be a function of how people are interacting and how and where people are interacting might be mediated by globalization. So that's going to be the first part of the model. And this whole thing where we thought, okay, we need to start this because here, because it's a basic thing, but we'll see what we get. We just got like a bunch of rich results. So that took us a big part of uh, our efforts have been devoted to that very simple and arguably unrealistic uh, setting. So, what do we find? Uh, first, it's obvious that we're going to get some sort of externalities here where, you know, if agents uh, are in an environment with a particularly bad disease and they start moving to other places, they're going to transmit the disease and that's going to exert externalities in other countries. The more subtle result here is it's an extreme form of externality in the sense that, in a sense to be formalized by the model, it's going to matter a lot 
the, the variance of infection rates. If, you, if you're in a world in which one country has a really bad disease environment, it doesn't really matter that the other guys get their act together and they kind of can try to can restrain the disease. Sooner or later, the disease is going to spread everywhere. Okay, it's like a weakest link type of uh, result. The second result we'll see is that it's not hard to generate uh, scenarios in which globalization is going to increase the range of parameter values for which pandemics occur and it makes them more severe. But this is not a theorem that's going to hold for any set of primitives of the model. And we'll see there's going to be situations in which actually declines in trade frictions might reduce uh, the, the spread uh, and the incidence of a pandemic. So a lot of what I'm going to emphasize is when is that going to be the case? Okay, is it realistic or not? Uh, empirically plausible or not? I don't know. Theoretically, we cannot discard it. So let's see what we should be looking for. Okay, and then there's some more results on the dynamics. We can get, you know, even with just two countries, we can get multiple waves of infection, very much like what we've seen in recent years and recent months, um, but not coming from lockdowns. That's a standard way to generate multiple waves in closed economy SIR models. Is you know, you lock down, you, you get it under control, then you open up again, you get a second wave. Here, there's no lockdowns or anything like that. We can still get multiple waves because different countries go enter the disease at different points in time. That's going to be part one. Then we're going to allow some feedback from the pandemics to globalization. How is How are pandemics going to affect globalization? There's basically two mechanisms. A, a, a first straightforward one, which is even if people remain clueless, if the disease kills people, or makes them sick, that's going to affect labor supply. And, it's, and that's going to have a feedback effect on the model. Um, the wages are going to evolve, context rates are going to evolve. And here we're going to get a, a result that we call a general equilibrium social distancing result, which basically has to do with the fact that if a country is going through a big wave and lots of people are dying or out of the labor force, relative wages are going to go up in that country and people are going to want to stay away from that country because it's going to be more expensive. The goods produced in those countries are going to become more expensive. Now, we'll see that this quantitatively doesn't seem, seem to have an awful lot of bite, but there's a second natural way in which pandemics are going to affect uh, globalization, and that has to do with the fact that people are not clueless. Okay, The reason uh, we're doing this remotely uh, is not because I'm sick or you are sick, but because we're all in a world of, of social distancing. I mean, obviously there's government regulations and so on and so forth, but we're all aware that people are dying because of something called COVID-19. We all understand that this is something we uh, uh, catch by contacting other people, and that leads us to cut back on those contacts. And to the extent that the cutting down of caught contacts is affecting, or those contacts are a key input into international trade, Obviously, that's going to affect the volume of trade. It's going to re lead to reductions in trade flows. And the question is going to be how large are they? How are large they are they relative to economic activity? And how quickly do we expect contacts and trade to recover after the crisis? Okay. So I'll uh, flesh it out a bit more, but we do get large reductions in trade to output as a response of a pandemic and, and potentially large welfare effects, both via deaths that are gonna affect welfare, but also via reduced gains from trade from the social distancing uh, uh, practices. Okay, so I, I'm sure there's maybe a lot of questions on your mind already about are we gonna do this or exactly how are we gonna organize this? If you allow me to go for a little bit more, I'll give you the first bit of the model, if that's okay. Unless Julia sees already some questions that are sort of first order. Let me just go through the beginnings of the model and then I'll pause at that point, okay? No, no questions yet. Great. There is a related literature. Uh, there are many related literatures. I'm not, uh, in the interest of time, I'm not uh, going to go over all this stuff, but obviously there, there's gravity literature. There is a literature on the role of business travel in international trade. Um, so that's um, that's particularly relevant here. Uh, it's missing here. I just noticed a couple of days ago, Ricardo Hausman has a nice paper in Nature recently related to this. There's an epi literature uh, in economics, like people uh, building on these models. I would perhaps highlight uh, the work of Cunha and Zimek, uh, who work in a regional setting, but it's also a sort of linking gravity and a structural model of gravity. So that's clearly a related paper to ours, but with very different focus in mind. And then obviously there's an empirical literature on trade and we're not the first ones to say that this is related. There's uh, economic historians that have worked on the Black Death and sort of linking it to trade. Um, 
So we owe, uh, you know, this is something that obviously we build on. Okay, so here's the outline. Uh, I Hopefully it's clear the three building blocks that I'm gonna go over. So I'm gonna start with the first one and then move to the next one. But I'm certainly gonna stop at uh, even at midway through this one, okay? Let me begin with a model then. And the first bit of the model is gonna be a trade model. Uh, it's gonna look fairly standard, I believe, uh, but there might be questions. So I think it's, it's good if I stop uh, in a couple of slides. So there's many, many ways we could have introduced human interactions in a trade model. And we're gonna do it in a way that we thought it was sort of as simple as possible. Um, and then we sort of gained some uh, assurance that the, the results we were after looked fairly robust. Uh, even if we change those assumptions. So it's gonna be uh, what we call an Armington model of trait in the sense that we're gonna have uh, differentiation of varieties based on origin with a slight twist on what origin means. Um, a lot of the equations I'm gonna show you in the trait model are basically holding exactly the same way with many, many countries, uh, but we're gonna work with a two country model. And that's largely because when we go to disease dynamics, uh, it's a very complicated system already. If we had more countries, it'd be a nightmare. Um, but I'll try to flag what's robust and what's not robust to many countries. Each location is gonna be, each of these two locations or countries is gonna be inhabited by a continuous measure of households, LI, uh, measure LI of households. And each household is gonna have one unit of labor and a blueprint to produce a differentiated variety. Okay, so rather than have differentiation at the country level, here we're gonna have it at the household level. Everybody produces something different. We can think about this as goods, you can think about this as services. Um, we're pretty you know, agnostic exactly uh, what this is. Now households are formed with, by two individuals. Here we're gonna have to count, think about individuals because you know, it's not countries that uh, 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 generate contagion, it's people meeting people that uh, generate contagion. So we're gonna have two house, uh, uh, agents in the household. One is gonna be a buyer and one is gonna be a seller. And the way we're gonna think about this is the buyer is gonna wake up in the morning and he's, uh, he or she is gonna go and travel to other households, domestic and international, and he's gonna try to procure varieties for consumption. So he's going shopping, okay? You can think about this as bringing consumption goods. This could be parts or components. You're visiting your suppliers. Uh, from which you're going to be buying stuff. So that's the buyer. He's the traveler or she. Uh, and the seller is at home. He or she is at home producing and has like a shop and sort of sells stuff to people that show up at uh, his or her uh, household for seeking consumption goods. Okay. So there's two uh, buyer and a seller. Okay. Just keep that in mind. And, you know, the fact that the buyer is traveling and not the seller, you might say, well, you know, if I thought about a mallet style model, it is, you have this seller that it's going to places. Bear with me. I mean, we could, we could have written that differently. It would have been more complicated, but it would deliver essentially the same insights. Okay. And this is, this is much simpler. Now, okay. So that's in terms of people. Now uh, uh, we know they travel and they bring goods. The first thing I want to introduce is, is, is costly trade. So trade is can you know goods can goods can be shipped across countries, but there's frictions to trade, which we're going to associate with distance, DIJ between I and J, but also some uh, human-made trade barriers, tariffs or whatever barriers you might think governments have some uh, um, some control over. Okay, so that's a trade in physical goods. There's these frictions. Now remember to bring in goods from abroad or from other places, we need to travel. So we we want to introduce some cost to mobility to limit the scope of interaction. So we have something to say about just how far are people gonna go to seek varieties for consumption. So those mobility costs take this form. They're again gonna be increasing in distance. They're gonna be increasing in the number of households that somebody visits, okay? The more households you visit, the more time you're away, the buyer and the seller, they love each other. They don't wanna be away from each other. So the longer you're away, the costlier it is. There's also some, uh, potentially government related uh, mobility costs like travel restrictions and then some parameters. And we think about this as utility costs. Again, this is, you know, they're away from each other and makes them sad. They don't wanna be away from each other. We could model this as a labor cost, but then you'd have to think about workers and who's getting, you know, 
in terms of disease dynamics, it's complicated matters. So we have an extension where we work that out. It's not going to matter too much. I think this is simpler than move to disease dynamics. Just think about there's these two people, one produces, the other one travels. Okay. And then, so there's some technical conditions for second order conditions. That's not very important. Now, in terms of welfare, we're going to have a standard CS aggregator over all the varieties that a given household consumes, which is a function of the countries from which varieties are consumed and the particular households or the number of households that the buyer is reaching both at home and abroad. Okay, so that's your standard CS aggregator. And then there's this utility costs. Okay, so yes, you want more varieties because there's a lot for variety, but you incur higher traveling costs. That's the model. The rest is just solving it. Okay, and you know, if you assume CES and if you start putting constant elasticities here or there, we know that you're going to get some sort of gravity. So if you work through the model, you have a standard CS demand for these varieties. Um, and then you can actually solve for bilateral trade flows between I and J. You need to do it across household, across varieties and so on. There's a lot of symmetry. You end up with something that looks like a gravity equation with uh, where how much I buys from uh, J uh, relative to total purchases are decreasing in the cost uh, abroad in terms of which uh, by uh, adjusted by productivity. And then it's decreased by this bilateral trade friction. So of which there's three types here, distance, mobility costs, and uh, tariffs, say, okay? And they all enter with different elasticities depending on how there's different uh, margins of adjustment uh, uh, of shape trade. We also have something that looks like a gravity equation for human interactions. And that's gonna be the key new thing that comes out of this model. It not only predicts straight flows, but the mobility of people from I to J. And that's gonna be the vehicle of transmission, okay? So we have this chloroform solution uh, uh, for NIJ. And then we are going to, what the main thing that I'm gonna get from the model I'm about to stop for the first time is going to be uh, how exactly trade integration shapes those contexts. This context that we typically take as given in SIR models are endogenous here and they're shaped by economic variables, how beneficial trade is or how costly it is. Okay. Now, once you have gravity, you know, you're going to get your standard beautiful results in terms of gains from trade uh, as a, uh, with the domestic trade share being a sufficient statistic as, a, as in ACR. The elasticity here is not one you could recover easily from a trade regression. It's not neither of those exponents. So that's a small twist. The more important twist here is that gains from trade are also mediated by population. That is, if you have something where trade is affecting how many people are working or are alive, obviously there's going to be an effect of trade on welfare that is mediated by deaths. Okay, so if uh, trade is generating deaths, then you want to take that into account uh, when you compute welfare gains. And then the final equilibrium condition is, uh, is going to be labor market clearing that um, uh, basically pins down relative wages across countries. But it's a standard looking, once you have gravity, we know this is standard looking, you got uniqueness and, and all this good stuff, okay? Now, I'm about to start stating results. So I think it's, I'm gonna stop here. This is the end of, of the model uh, and see if there's any questions on the framework. If there's anything that wasn't clear, um, it'd be a good time to ask. Yeah, there are two clarifying questions. One uh, is from uh, Jo van Biesebroek, and he's asking, are there distances and trading costs both within and between countries? Correct. So that's, uh, that's the first one. Yes. So um, potentially, yes. I mean, you know, whether you want to set mu UII, DII, TII to... Uh, one or higher than one, it doesn't matter. I think for some results, it's important that they're lower than the international ones, uh, but they don't have to take a value of one. Great, thanks. And the, the second question slash uh, suggestion by uh, Richard Baldwin uh, says, I guess the bilateralism travel to shops wouldn't work for goods trade in organized markets, maybe an angle for empirical testing. Exactly. So that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. I mean, this is the source of heterogeneity. How much um, does this apply to different things, right? Oil, right? Um, so I'm gonna come back. I have a picture for you, Richard. Um, um, uh, you might think about services, um, you know, in the sense of intensity of how important these things are. I think another thing that is very clear, uh, but this would take us far is the issue of, um, I'd be willing to bet that this face-to-face -face interactions are more important for initiating trade transactions 
than about continuing them. Um, and that's not something we're going to capture here because we don't have like meaningful dynamics. Uh, but once you've got your suppliers and so on, I mean, maybe remotely you can make it happen. But the first, you know, how do you pick somebody? Uh, I think that face to face is going to be more important. So we don't have that here. But again, um, you know, if we want to take this to the model, to the data, sorry, we would probably want to, we would surely want to develop these extensions a bit more. Okay. More questions great. for you. Awesome. So let me tell you what we get from the trade model and then uh, naturally uh, move on to the uh, SIR model. I became blurred. Okay, so let me tell you the first two results we get here uh, in the trade model. So if you look at uh, this sort of intera uh, human interactions between I and J, you can rewrite them like this, That's, it's not very important. The first result we get is how trade frictions, okay, think about globalization as being associated uh, more globalization with lower trade frictions, uh, lower trade costs generate more trade. How does that affect those interactions? So the first result we get is that if you reduce trade frictions, you make the world more globalized, that's going to A, reduce human to human interactions at the local level and B, increase the international ones. This is not rocket science, okay? If we make things more global, we're gonna travel more, have more global interactions, but there is like a bit of a, you know, you're increasing the, uh, uh, the cost of like having the local ones. So you're shifting from foreign ones to uh, local ones, not too surprising, uh, but that's gonna be key because it's gonna, as, you, as the level of trade frictions affects the geography of interactions, that's gonna have an effect on disease transmission. Uh, the perhaps less obvious result is that if you are close enough to symmetry, by symmetry here, I mean population size, productivity, and trade costs. If you reduce trade frictions and you do so in a symmetric way, you're in a symmetric world, um, global human interactions are gonna go up. You know, you cut on the local ones, you increase the foreign ones, but the sum goes up. So we live in a world in which people are bumping much more into each other than in the past, even though there's this substitution. Now, this is not a theorem. If, you're, if you have enough symmetry, this may not hold actually, okay? but that's Part of the reason why some of the results are gonna be less obvious, but it's not necessarily the only thing that's gonna matter. Uh, but if you had the intuition that we're now bumping into more people, yes, uh, if, if there's more symmetry, that's what you're gonna get, okay? Now you might wonder how uh, robust these results are and we've worried about things like, you know, on this one, I worried that, does that have to do with modeling this cost as utility cost? If there's labor cost, maybe the crowding out effect is larger. It, it, no. It, that's not an issue. You can model this in terms of labor. Uh, it's not gonna matter. You can reinterpret the model as one of uh, sourcing inputs rather than final goods. So it's more about global value chains than uh, just shopping for apples. Um, we've sort of done a mallet style model where it's the seller that leaves the home and tries to sell the good and goes to buyers and, and tries to sell their stuff. Um, the reason we don't do this in the baseline is because if you wanna do that, then you're gonna have to introduce in, uh, imperfect competition to generate some profits that allow you to recoup fixed costs, um, but it's doable um, and we've done it and it doesn't matter. And again, all the conditions, all the equilibrium conditions would hold in a multi-country world, even with like a continuum of locations, if you wanna put that in a spatial setting. Um, some of these results, you need to be a bit careful with multi, you know, country, multi-countries, multi, multi -countries. But, but other than that, it's all the same. Okay, so now let me give you the building blocks of the SIR model. And before I tell you the results, I'm going to maybe stop again. Okay. And this is where I think most of you have seen these models by now. But if not, um, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. So now I'm going to, you know, now that we've solved for this human interactions, I'm going to draw some implications for the disease uh, transmission. So to remind you, we have a model in which in the standard day, day is sort of a loose word. Buyer I, uh, buyers in I leave the house and visit NII sellers at home and NIJ sellers in J. And sellers in I, uh, they produce and they sell their own goods. They receive NII domestic visitors and NJI foreign visitors. Okay, this is the context that the two members of the household have in a given day. We're gonna assume that buyers, when they go and travel abroad, they don't go in like packed planes where they get, con you know, they might uh, uh, get the disease. Obviously that's arguably one of the main reasons why we're not traveling. So that's a bit of an abstraction, uh, but it would complicate matters. So we just think about transmission happening between buyers and sellers and not uh, themselves. 
we do a, we do allow the household to be to have a passionate marriage in the sense that there's perfect disease transmission within the household and that's going to simplify matter if one of the household members gets the disease the other one gets it immediately now what are the uh, dynamics of the disease you've seen this sir models basically you take the population in a given location and you divide it into three types uh, susceptible agents people that have not had the disease yet infected or infectious uh, agents and recovered agents. Then we can add deaths. I'm not gonna have deaths for now, okay? But I'm gonna add them later. And um, in order to understand how the stock of uh, this, uh, how the share of population of different types evolves, we have this dynamic equations. I always like to start with the infected one. That's sort of the, the key one. And it's basically the equation that tells you how new infections are gonna emerge in location I. So there's three main sources of infection here. First, there's infections coming from domestic infection, from domestic interactions. What are those? Well, remember that both the buyer and the seller have NII uh, contacts in a given day. So two times NII, this is the contacts they have in a given day. We are gonna assume that with a rate alpha I, that's gonna generate infection, okay? That is, if the, the uh, household is susceptible at the, before the interaction and it's meeting an infected individual that's going to generate an infection at a rate alpha i. Now we're going to allow this parameter to be location specific. It could reflect cultural norms, uh, climate, uh, or health policies, uh, or you know the extent to which the president of that location says wearing masks is a good thing or not. Okay, so part of it is policy, and part of it is uh, is, is is given is natural. So that's the first bit. That's you can have like your standard domestic infections, but remember the buyer is going abroad, okay? And if the buyer is susceptible and meets an infected individual abroad, that's going to generate an infection with right alpha J, okay? So, uh, and we, you know, you could imagine this could be IJ specific, uh, but we're just going to make that J specific, okay? And there's NIJ of those contacts. And then similarly, there's like the foreign buyers that are coming into the seller and they're gonna generate this infectious NJI with alpha I, those contacts happen in country I, and then uh, the same as I, IJ. That's how new infections emerge. There's an, uh, a, a flow out of infection, those are the recovered. And we let uh, gamma I be the rate of recovery, which again could be country specific, depending on how good the health system is uh, or, or whatever drugs they use or, or um, whatever the president recommends people take, okay? So those are the infections, okay? Now we have a similar equation for susceptible agents. And that's just basically the first three terms here negative. This is a model where, you know, there's no newborns or no, uh, there's gonna be immunity. So once you've gone through it, you don't go back to the susceptible pool. We could extend that obviously. Um, so basically all that happens in terms of susceptible is we're losing people as they get infected. And then the recovered at any point in time, they grow with the rate of recovered. Okay. Um, let me push a bit more if there's no immediate questions. Okay. So if you were to be in a closed economy world, this would look basically like a, 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 an SIR model uh, in the sense that you'd only have the domestic infections and then you'd get equations if you, uh, if you define two alpha I and I as beta I this would look as like, if you go to Wikipedia, the SIR model, this is how it's represented. And we know that this beta I, the so-called uh, um, uh, reproduction uh, rate or not, uh, is, a key per, is a key value for the dynamics of the model. If this happens to be less than one, then it, even if you have some disease, some infections early on there, you know, you're gonna go through a dynamics where infections are gonna go down over time. So if you start small, you're just gonna get basically zero infections. But if you're over one, there's going to be a period of rising infections. You're going to reach a peak and then they're going to go down and you're going to end up with a share of the population being infected, uh, which is determined by an equation that you can't solve in closed form, but it's very easy to kind of solve for. Okay, so that's basically determined the steady state or the you know, steady state value of susceptible agents. And one minus that is basically going to be those that uh, were infected. Okay. So that's a well understood system by now. Um, now, how does our system look? Uh, well, it's slightly different because there's two countries and there's uh, different sort of uh, sources of infection, okay? So what's the reproduction number in this global economy is gonna be a little bit uh, different, but it turns out that it's not that hard to characterize it, okay? 
So if you focus on the infections equations we had before, we're now with two countries, you could do that for multiple ones, but with two countries, you basically have this uh, system of equations that you can write in matrix form. And then we can borrow uh, results from uh, the uh, epi literature that tell us that you can actually solve for R naught uh, as the spectral radius, that's the um, uh, largest eigenvalue, of this matrix, F times V minus one, which uh, in Appy they call the next generation matrix. And in our case, uh, you can actually solve for this in closed form. Okay, and you get this uh, beautiful uh, formula here. And I want you to kind of notice the following about this formula. This is basically gonna determine the extent to which at the global level, we're gonna have a pandemic or not. We're gonna have rising infections at the world level uh, or not. And what's interesting is that it's obvious that it's increasing in this cross country um, contagion. Okay, so if NIJ or NJI go up, holding other things constant, that's gonna go up. Um, so if you, but if this become arbitrarily small, you can show that R naught cannot be lower than either this or that. But are, what are these? These are the domestic reproduction rates. That's the the betas, if you will, associated with domestic transactions or domestic interactions. So in words, this is basically saying that if any of the two countries is a beta higher than one based on their local interactions, you're not gonna avoid a pandemic, okay? It doesn't matter that one country has something that might be arbitrarily close to zero. If the other country is above one based on domestic interactions, uh, you're going to have a pandemic. So that's an, ex uh, an extreme form of externality, which is really it's the weakest link type of uh, uh, result that if somebody doesn't get their act together, uh, they're going to generate a global pandemic. Now, that doesn't mean that all countries are going through big waves or anything like that. This is all in terms of global dynamics. So I, I want to be clear about that. Now, that's next is going to beg the question uh, as to Okay, what does that mean in terms of how globalization shapes this pandemics? That is, is the fact that NIJ and JI increase this means globalization is gonna enhance pandemics? No, you need to be careful because NII, you know, the domestic rates are also endogenous to globalization. And I've shown you that when you make the world more globalized, those are gonna go down and the other ones are gonna go up. So where the balance of those things are gonna end is not entirely clear, okay? So I'll, I'll get to that uh, in a second. Now, in terms of uh, more generally, so the dynamics of the system are not is gonna be keen that if it's lower than one, we're not gonna have a global pandemic. Some countries might go through a curve, but at the global level, we're not gonna have a global pandemic. Uh, and if you're above one, you are gonna have a pandemic, global pandemic and the steady state values of susceptibles at home and abroad are given by this solution to the system of equations, which again, we cannot solve in closed form, but you can do comparative statics on it. It's pretty simple. Um, in terms of sort of uh, graphically showing this externality, here we have a case where uh, essentially we have one country. It's a healthy, relatively healthy country uh, with an alpha one of 0.04. These values that are in line with what macro people have been using of late. And then we have another country, alpha two, that we let their alpha two range from 0.04 2.1. So it's an, a more unhealthy country and we're making it more and more unhealthy as we increase alpha two. And you see that we've picked parameters such that if alpha two is not that much larger than 0.04, nothing's going to happen because we're still at a global R naught that is less than one. But if at some point alpha two is sufficiently high, even though alpha one would have avoided a pandemic on its own, the fact that alpha two has a worse disease environment generates a wave both in two, but also in one. Okay, and notice this is pretty steep. So around, and that's sort of a point that's been made by, by a few people lately. It's not just that our zero higher or lower than one. It's if you're a bit to the right of it, you can get like a big, big increase of infections. Okay, so it's the externality could actually be quite, uh, quite powerful. Um, let me let me make, maybe go a couple state a couple of results and that might be a more natural result uh, point to stop. Okay, Julia, is that okay? Uh, uh, yeah, sure. It's uh, I'll take two two more slides and then pause. Great. So now let me get into the the meat of things, which is here the effect of globalization on pandemics. That is, I've shown you some dynamics, a range in which you're going to have a pandemic or not. The question you might be interested in: 
how is the world now different than 150 years ago or 50 years ago? Okay, so one way in which it's different is that we're in a world with lower trade costs and lower mobility costs. Okay, so how is that gonna shape pandemics? So the first result we have, it sort of relates to the proposition three that I stated before, which is that if countries are sufficiently symmetric in the sense that uh, they have same population, same technology, same trade costs. And additionally, there's a type of, there's something missing here. Suppose that both the alphas and the gammas are the same. So I'm missing the alpha here, it should be there. So it's full symmetry. Then if you reduce trade costs, that's going to lead to higher r naughts. And whenever you have a pandemic, it's gonna lead to more infections. What's the logic here? It's proposition three, that is under symmetry, if we reduce straight frictions, people are bumping into each other much more, and that's gonna generate more disease transmission and more death, uh, more uh, infections. We don't have deaths at the time. Okay, so graphically, same as before, there's two country one and two, but instead of changing alpha two, all I'm doing here is I'm changing trade costs. And if trade costs are sufficiently large, then even though country two has a worse disease environment, we're gonna avoid a pandemic. But at some point, if we reduce trade costs a little bit, then we're gonna start having more and more infections. Okay, I call them recovered here in the sense that in order to be recovered, you have to be, have been infected before. So in steady state, those two things are the same. And you see that again, this is pretty steep. If you thought, okay, we should lower trade costs because we believe in freer trade and it's gonna, uh, uh, it's, we're gonna get gains from trade. Yes, but if you wanna factor in the disease, this is a fairly steep response to it. Okay, so it's gonna work against uh, gains from trade. You can do that with trade costs. You can do that with mobility costs. So if you're looking for this, okay, this guy's going to tell me that globalization is is gonna is gonna make pandemics worse and happen more often. This is your result, okay? But there is a reason this is called a proposition and not a theorem, and there is a reason why I'm saying that under symmetry, okay? So the the, the question is when will this result fail, okay? So. <clears throat> numerically can fail under a variety of circumstances, but one that is particularly powerful, and that's the, I think the last slide I'm gonna show before I pause, is a case in which the asymmetries are not in economic fundamentals, but they are in health fundamentals, which here there's two parameters, the alphas and the gammas, the uh, infection, infection rate and the recovery rate. And if those vary sufficiently across countries, one of the country has a much higher alpha I and a much lower gamma I, so people remain, you know, are infected and remain infected longer, then we can show that if there's sufficient variation in this across countries, if you reduce trade frictions, that actually decreases R0. And when R0 is higher than one, it's gonna lead to a higher share of the population in the right high risk, unhealthy country to become infected, and it may also reduce this share in the other country. So this last part, I wanna uh, pause and sort of illustrate because it's particularly counterintuitive. So, and I'm gonna show it with trade costs, but you can see it with mobility costs too. So what I'm doing here is I have two countries. Country two is more unhealthy, higher alpha, lower gamma. And country one is actually quite healthy. Now, as you start reducing trade costs, you initially, you know, you have the sort of intuitive result, which is if I reduce trade costs, people from the unhealthy country are wanna, gonna wanna come into my country and they're gonna generate more infections, okay? So higher trade costs are going to be something you want to kind of fight the disease. But notice that you reach a point where if you reduce trade costs, that's actually the way to fight the pandemic. Okay, and that's true for symmetric trade cost reductions and symmetric mobility re reductions. But even unilaterally, there's ranges of parameter values for which the healthy country will wanna reduce the cost that the unhealthy individuals need to face to be able to come and transact in your country. You might say, why would you wanna bring you know, sick people to your own country? And the reason here is again, that proposition too, which is if, you make freight, uh, trade and mobility freer, those guys are gonna spend less time in their unhealthy environment and more in yours. So by taking that action, you actually, that's your way to try to ameliorate the situation in the foreign country. And that you get a benefit from because of the externality. 
If you help them fight the disease by having them spend less time in their unhealthy environment, that's going to uh, make, it, um, make it beneficial for you in the long run in that under some parameter values, you might actually be able to avoid the pandemic altogether. So the point here is not that this is sort of plausible necessarily or like that you would wanna have policies based on that, but that you really wanna think hard about what policies are gonna to do to mobility. And if you wanna, um, in some situations and you wanna fight the disease by blocking people from coming in, you better make sure you completely block it because if you fall short of full blocking, you might actually be worse off than in a situation in which you don't have restrictions to begin with. Okay, so that's uh, 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 that proposition seven, which is somewhat counterintuitive, but once you understand the logic, it, it makes some sense. Let me pause here, maybe, Julia, if there's any questions at this point. Yeah, yeah. I, as you were presenting the, the propositions, some questions connected to the setup of the trade uh, model. So one is from Jo van Wiesbroek again, and he's asking, um, with a continuum of households within the country producing differentiated uh, goods, how is it that NII, so the number of varieties, uh, II, uh, is smaller than the number of households. And he's asking uh, whether there are fixed costs of buying each variety. And a related question, uh, somewhat related question by Marcelo Larriaga is whether NII and NIJ should maybe sum uh, to a constant intuitively reflect reflecting that people might have um, so many people they can meet in a day. Okay, great. So these are basically one and the same question. They're, they're very mm -hmm. much related. Yeah. And um, um, the main thing here is what I call the technical condition. You're kind of objecting to it, but it's we are putting enough curvature in the uh, cost, utility cost of having contacts. And uh, to ensure first that the choice of NIJ is defined by marginal benefit versus marginal cost rather than a resource constraint. And second, when we do things numerically, we're always picking parameter values, say C large enough to make sure that what Johannes is mentioning is not an issue, that you're, you don't go to the corner, okay? So the constraint that, um, you know, it, first you, there's no constraint in terms of I have 24 hours and there's only so many people I can meet. I always wanna be less. And second, we're always choosing so that you want to visit less people than there are available. And then those that you actually pick, uh, they're picked at random. So then for the continuum, it's not going to matter. But yes, both points are good. There could be some constraints in this problems and, and we're staying away from corner solutions. Uh, hopefully that's clear. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, good. So uh, having stated these results, there's one more result I want to emphasize, but then I, I really want to get into the other parts where, our, where we're going to make the model a bit richer and more uh, realistic. Um, but you know, this result on second waves, for instance. Um, so I've said a lot about global or not and how you know, we have a global pandemic or not, less so about individual dynamics of countries, because those could be very, very rich. This is an example where uh, the, the red country, country one, notice is actually going through two waves of infections. I don't have lockdowns or anything, but this is a situation where the parameters are chosen such that country got one goes through a, a, a disease uh, pretty quickly and then they fight it. But then eventually that disease makes its way to country two, but slowly so that disease peaks much later. But that second country is large enough to generate a second wave in country one. So that's something that you can generate numerically. We have the hunch that if you had more countries, you could generate more and more waves. So now the second wave is coming in many places. Uh, unluckily, there's like more than two countries or two, or more than two continents. So unless we get a vaccine, I mean, God only knows how many waves of this thing we're going to go through. And part of it has been lockdowns, but there's just telling you that the global nature of this is actually generating this multiple waves. Okay, now let me tell you about uh, uh, the remaining parts of the paper. So the, what we're going to do now is say, okay, maybe uh, and I, perhaps I wasn't explicit enough about this, but up to now, I've focused on a dynamic system in which there are no deaths. And remember, the NIIs, they're endogenous to the model. They're a function of parameters, uh, population size, uh, all the parameters, and wages. And I've been treating them as constant. And that's fine as long as the disease is not generating 
any labor uh, supply effects or any deaths. Okay, so that's why we isolated this by saying NII is constant, like in the plain vanilla SIR model, but we want, it's not constant in the sense that if you were to look at different globalization regimes, it might be higher or lower. But now we wanna think about situations in which contact rate actually evolves uh, uh, during the pandemic um, because things are changing over time, okay? There's many things that could be changing over time. Maybe, you know, maybe people are getting afraid or this and that. I'm gonna to get to that later. And first just look at the case in which whatever's happening is simply that there are people that are dropping out of the labor market and that has general equilibrium effects on wages. Okay, so that's gonna be the first part where we're gonna continue to assume that nobody is cutting down on contacts based on what they observe, but there are deaths and the deaths are affecting labor supply. So how does that, how do deaths affect the dynamics? And I'm going to focus on death, but we could have like different types of labor supply responses. I get sick and I stay at home. Well, here, the only way that's going to change, if I don't change productivity and I don't change trade costs and I don't change uh, mobility costs or anything like that, there's no lockdowns. The only thing that's going to be happening is that the, the wage is changing as labor supply changes across countries. Okay. And, you know, deaths might be varying and evolving differently in different countries. So all we're doing is, tr is tracing that, uh, those wage dynamics. Conceptually, the main result we get is that we obtain a form of general equilibrium social distancing. And that just basically comes from the fact that in the country that has a disproportionate amount of deaths at a point in time, that's going to lead to a negative relative supply uh, shock that's going to lead to a higher relative wage in that country. The higher is the relative wage of a country, the less desirable are the varieties, the more costlier and less desirable, desirable the varieties in that country, people are gonna to wanna to travel last to that country. And as a result, they're gonna stay away from that country, but not because it's, there's a lot of deaths, but simply because wages are higher. Okay, so that's, it's not purposeful social distancing, individual social distancing is a form of general equilibrium social distancing. So we thought that was kind of cute and, oh, how, uh, let's take, put, put it to the data, how big it is. Uh, honestly, sort of, yes, obviously, it, it, if you run the model simulated, you can find situations where uh, it's visible, but quantitatively, it was hard to kind of find examples where it was very, very powerful, okay? And just because this general equilibrium forces, uh, at least in a two country model, maybe with multiple countries, for small countries, it could be large, but we couldn't find this to, well, conclusion is, is, is it's cute, but I'm not sure how big quantitatively uh, it's gonna be, okay? But you can certainly uh, illustrate it. The more interesting case of uh, the interplay is the one I'm gonna focus in the remaining minutes, which is coming from the fact that people are not clueless. Okay, and they're not clueless and they understand that there's people dying and they read the newspaper and they understand that they're dying because there's a disease unfolding and they understand that the disease is unfolding through human interactions and they understand that if they themselves have human interactions, they might get sick and die. Um, okay, so that's what we're going to consider here. We're going to have to simplify matters though. I mean, there's things that we can handle and things that right now we cannot handle. So let me tell you what we can handle. So first, uh, we're going to focus on the role of deaths, okay? And we're going to follow Farbudi uh, and, and co-authors um, um, and continue to assume uh, that agents are symptomatic, okay? You could have a version of this where you may be symptomatic and then stay at home and not infect people and asymptomatic. You, you need some asymptomatic people, obviously. If everybody was symptomatic and behaving properly, you could cut down on, on, on transmissions. So we're not gonna have here, uh, that here, everybody's gonna be asymptomatic. And we're actually gonna assume that you don't really know what status you, you are. You could be susceptible, you could be uh, infected, um, you could be recovered and you don't know. And you know, at some degree, to some degree, we don't know. We don't know whether we've had it in the past, we might have it right now, as long as we're asymptomatic. But you understand that you could be in these different states and you understand that you can die with certain probability. And, and that's something that you experience. That is something one experiences and there's a utility cost associated with that, which is that from then on, you're not gonna be enjoying any utility. So that's gonna affect the net present discounted value of future utility. Now, even though you know, know your own health status, we're gonna assume that you have rational expectations and you can figure out the share of population that are susceptible, infected, or recovered. So when you meet somebody at random, 
there's some probability you're going to assign that that person might infect you. Now, you might say, how, could, how can we form those expectations if we don't know, you know, if, we, if people don't know whether they're infected or recovered? Well, it turns out that just observing deaths, if you know the parameters of the model, you can back out from deaths. Uh, this aggregate shares. So still, you don't know your own status, but you can figure out on average what is the probability that somebody I meet is of different status. Okay. Now the problem here is going to be dynamic. It's going to be a dynamic uh, uh, problem in which I'm sort of choosing my context rates over time uh, as the as the disease unfolds. There's one as extra assumption uh, that we're not very happy with, but it, now we're a bit happier with which is to make the problem tractable. And for reasons that I can highlight in the next slide, we need to solve a commitment problem where at time zero, I choose a whole path of future interactions. And there's rational expectations, there's no one's aggregate uncertainty. That's fine, but you really need to commit to that. It's, and, and the reason we need to assume that is because the non-commitment problem would look different. Luckily, it actually doesn't look all that different. And I can say a word about that. But the main reason for this is that you're basically solving this problem where you're maximizing the net present discounted value of uh, your utility, there's some discount rate, and this is your uh, consumption, you know, your welfare from consuming varieties, we had that before, and then there's this cost of uh, moving, which we had before. But you're choosing now a whole path of contacts, okay? And you understand that your state, whether you're susceptible, infected, or dead, is changing over time according to the standard laws of SIR and are a function of whether you are susceptible at a point in time and you meet an infected individual uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so lowercase letters are my own variables, the probability with which I'm infected or not, uh, and uh, cap letters are the shares in the population. Okay, so the main reason uh, the commitment issue comes from the fact that, you know, I enjoy this utility as long as I'm alive. And with certain probability, I die, and the probability is given by the system. But this enters linearly rather than exponentially, so it, there's this commitment issue. But it turns out that if you take a, an exponential uh, approximation to this, so that the commitment and no commitment solution are one and the same, numerically we get exactly like almost the same. So uh, we might revert to the exponential death version because that it avoids this technical issue. Now, what do you get from this dynamic problem? So conceptually or, or qualitatively. On the one hand, you get this social distancing result, which is if um, you can show that in the static model, you were equating the marginal benefit of interactions to its marginal cost. Now you're not gonna do that in the sense that you're gonna hold back on the interactions. And you're gonna hold back on the interactions because the cost of meeting is not just the utility cost of being away from my household, but it's the utility cost of potentially being infected, dying with some probability, and in the process dying my partner as well. Uh, killing my partner as well, okay? So that's why uh, you're gonna have this sort of natural cut down in economic activity. Now you can show this analytically too, but graphically, I think what's particularly interesting here is that first, um, well, two things. So the first one is what are the effects on the dynamics? And that's something that macro people have emphasized, which is that once you have these individual responses, and this is where economics really comes into the picture, which we have models to figure out how behavior changes as a result of health, health risks, this is gonna to tend to flatten the curve. This is what macro people have been telling us for a while, which is if you cut down on the interactions, the disease is gonna slow down, but obviously it's gonna last more because we're gonna take longer to kind of reach herd immunity uh, if there's no vaccine. Okay, but you know, if you worry about hospitalization, crowd ups and things like that, you really want this to happen. So we get the same type of stuff. What's novel here, more novel here, more interesting from a trade perspective is that we have effects on the dynamics of trade. In particular, now we're gonna have a feedback from the pandemic on economic activity, and it's much more powerful than this general equilibrium and social distancing. And in particular, if you're an unhealthy country, people are gonna to wanna to stay away from you because they understand that the, the, the probability with which they might get infected and die in your unhealthy environment is higher. So they wanna cut down on that. So that together with the fact that the marginal utility of consumption is gonna be higher for domestic varieties than foreign ones because you get more out of them because of lower trade costs, this is Johannes' question, that's gonna generate much of a, more of a cut down on international trade than on domestic trade. So the trade to output ratio is gonna tank on impact once we realize it's a pandemic, but here notice that it recovers pretty quickly. 
So yes, we can predict a trade decline based on in, in this very simple model, but we also predict that trade recovers uh, very quickly. Now you might wonder uh, the extent to which this is realistic or not, and second, how robust it is. So a couple of figures, and then I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop because I'm basically out of time. So how realistic it is, this is something that I added this morning. This is, uh, Julia, this is the reason why the slides are different than online. So this is some data, preliminary data we have on the effect of the recent tr tr uh, health crisis on trade. So on the left hand side, I have this sort of Dutch data that many people have used, the World uh, Trade Monitor. And you see that on impact um, um, in March and April, big decline in trade flows. Um, and it's a decline that has actually exceeded um, uh, the decline in output. So the trade to uh, industrial output ratio has gone down, um, but it's, it's recovered very quickly. A lot of people are talking about that quick recovery. Um, and on the right hand side, I have a, 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 a figure for Richard. Okay, so it, this is even more preliminary or tentative, but it's this folks at the IMF that are constructing these daily estimates of trade flows based on satellite data on where ships are and the nature of the ships. So you can actually distinguish between uh, bulk trade, oil trade, containers, vehicles, etc. What you see is Richard's absolutely right. I mean, the decline in oil was much lower. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's, it's basically back to where it was. Uh, if you look at GVC trade, the automobiles being an example of that, um, it's kind of cool that you see a massive decline. Many people have talked about that. You, you see the Chinese wave, the European US wave, okay? The, this is affecting the different times, uh, but also many people have talked about the very fast recovery, okay? And we're not out of the pandemic by any means, but you know, so far it sort of seems that things are recovering quickly. We've played with a model, introduced adjustment costs, thinking maybe, you know, we want to think about uh, how adjustment costs would come into the picture, maybe generate lower decline. Maybe it would also generate anticipatory effects, which is anticipating future pandemics. Maybe uh, you're going to cut down activity and you're going to enter a pandemic with lower activity than you would otherwise if you kind of foresee that with some probability you're going to enter a pandemic. Um, but we haven't found that this is particularly powerful. Even when we've introduced this, um, we don't find that at, when the pandemic is over, there's obvious reasons why trade is going to be permanently lower than it was before. Now, there's ways to make that happen. Maybe we walk out of this with a new phobia for pandemics and we ascribe a probability of future pandemics that is much higher than what historical evidence suggests. And that might be a way in which we might have more permanent effects. But perhaps because of the limitations of, and abstractions of the model or the way we've modeled certain things, we just don't have not been found, have not found anything that makes us particularly wary or sort of that alerts us to potential threats uh, to globalization coming from, uh, from pandemics, okay? So it, during the pandemic, surely big effects, big deaths, big welfare effects, but uh, on the long run perspective, uh, the results we have found are, are much, uh, much less alarming. And I think I'm, this is just a concluding slide. I'll let you read through it if you're interested. Um, but I think I should stop at this point. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Paul. Um, so we now have 15 minutes for open discussion. So please uh, click on the raise hand button uh, so we can unmute you and you can ask uh, your question or, or contribute your, your comment. Uh, perhaps while, um, while people collect uh, thoughts, um, a couple of questions from uh, people in the, in the panel. So let me uh, start with a follow-up to, to this last graph uh, that, that you showed and to Richard's question. One thing that was coming to mind was um, whether also the degree of this, uh, the, the, how necessary this phase of uh, interactions are in specific uh, countries, maybe where the contracting environment is particularly uh, weak. So, and this, I guess, can correlate highly with the health environment as well. So I'm not sure if you can also bring in this additional source of heterogeneity to the model, but um, the question is how, how we should think about this, uh, this other source of heterogeneity, if, if at all, uh, in, in the context of, of your model. And uh, a different question that is uh, more on the clarifying side connected to the behavioral responses. When, I, I'm not sure if I followed fully, but uh, I understood that kind of the buyer decides how many households to, to visit and then the seller takes the, the visits uh, without making a choice on that. So 
there is kind of no matching mechanics at play. And one, one thing I was wondering is uh, whether it's intuitive to think that you can also veto uh, who, who visits your household. And if the implication of that is that just the, the, the result you show on the number of varieties depends or, or if there's something else that, that could happen in that uh, when one thinks of that kind of matching uh, uh, type of problem. Great question. So um, on the first one, yes. I mean, I think um, one would need to think exactly how to introduce that heterogeneity. Uh, I think um, a natural thing would be to think about uh, a choice of two technologies to procure goods. One would be the one we have here. And then maybe there's an alternative that does not require face-to-face -face interactions, um, but that comes at some uh, cost productivity cost or something like that. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying is that and for some so sort of countries or for some sort of goods, that alternatively is gonna be particularly crappy. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if you don't do that face-to-face, -face, um, that's gonna come at a higher cost. And indeed that's, I mean, part of this is uh, related to Meredith Stark's paper on, yeah. on Nigerian, um, a Nigerian uh, market participants that have to travel to China to kind of procure all the stuff. And, um, and, and so it seems that for some sort of environments or sort of types of goods, um, it, is, uh, uh, it is like services or tourism, right? I mean, we, we can all like visit uh, museums in Florence remotely, but I mean, anybody who's been in these museums knows that it's not quite the same. Um, so that's an interesting dimension that one can explore. Um, the second one remind me was uh, the question on on basically the the, the choice of not visiting uh, certain countries. Uh, yeah, 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 no, no, no. Uh, yes, of course. Yes. So I, I have I've uh, you know every time I, I go through that stuff I, I think that yeah we we didn't do that and it sort of makes sense. You can close your shop. So if you yeah. close your shop, uh, then you you're not going to get in, uh, infected. Um, I, I'd have to th think how exactly we can, um, we can, I mean, it, it would require changing a few things, right? But where the contact rate is going to be then a function of uh, the choices of both agents. So yeah. it sort of generates that alternative stuff. I think intuitively you're right that it's, if anything, it's going to generate a bigger, uh, a bigger response uh, once you internalize that. With exams, it's probably not going to matter an awful lot. But once you do that, you, you probably get a bigger response. Um, but it's not it's not totally trivial, but it's something we should think more about. It makes sense. Great. So we have uh, a couple of uh, virtual hands up. Uh, Richard Baldwin, if you want to go first. Marcelo, you can go second. Oh, um, hi, Paul. Great paper. Thank you very much for this. Have you thought about how domestic lockdown policies might uh, spill over into trade and international transmission? The short answer is, is not enough. Um, um, the, the, main, the main sort of, perhaps the main insight that I, that, I would, that I would say we have here is that if your goal is to completely avoid a global pandemic um, coming to your country, um, you really have to go to the Chinese way, which is you need to like completely control things. M you know, doing a bit might actually, in some cases, might be counterproductive, and that that's not something that we often um, we talk about. But it's on the one hand, it's it's very nonlinear, right? I mean, it's it's it could be the case that you know, you go like 70% of the way, but it's really not doing you much. Uh, if you completely kind of control things and we don't have testing and obviously a lot of things that are realistic right now with the current health crisis. Uh, but if you go, you know, if you can completely make sure that anybody comes in, is not infecting, then that's the way to go. But if you fall short, the marginal benefit of all these actions uh, could actually, um, could actually uh, harm you. What we haven't thought too much about, and I think maybe that's more the spirit of your question, is, is there's been a lot of debates about the, what the lockdowns are doing and they're slowing down the thing. Um, is it good or bad? And uh, did we do too much early on? Um, um, and 
how does that interact with globalization? That's not something we've thought a lot about, uh, but that's certainly very interesting. That there might be some new insights there. Great. Marcelo Larriaga, do you want to unmute yourself? Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Paul, for, for a great presentation. I was wondering whether um, uh, most of what you presented was in this two country world and whether an extension to a three country world. I, I know you have the end country, but whether an extension into a three country world where you can look at questions about uh, preferential agreements and perhaps pandemic diversion, um, what, what would be the result there for the, the social planner? The, the, the intuition I'm getting from the presentation is that perhaps the social planner would, would like to have um, negative assortative matching in terms of, of pandemic, that he would like to match countries trading with each other uh, that uh, with low and very high uh, pandemic rates. Is that right? Maybe. I don't know. I'd have to, I'd have to think about uh, that. It's certainly interesting. Um, I mean, there's many, many, I mean, I think, I, I think the spirit of your question, it's, it's, we're going to keep some health parameters relatively symmetric and we're going to look at different configurations of trade cost reductions and see how they sort of spill over to third countries. Um, I have often have a hard enough time to think about trade diversion in a three country model with just trade. So if you had the pandemic stuff, it's not something that I can do on my feet, uh, uh, but it's certainly interesting. Yeah, I don't know if there's, um, yeah, it's sort of very interesting. There, there's this block dimension to all this, uh, you know, you got the European, you know, wave and then you got the Asian one. And I guess the extent to which uh, you have these blocks that are much more integrated than the cross blocks uh, might be part of the story, but I haven't thought enough about it. Uh, but it's certainly worth thinking about. Thanks. Uh, Monica Mrasova also had a question. Monica, if you want to unmute yourself. Yeah, hi. Uh, so thank you, Paul, for the great presentation. A kind of obvious question uh, for, from me. Uh, so you are assuming CS, which uh, gives you a really beautiful feature, features of the model. Uh, do you have an intuition how the interplay between trade and pandemics would change if you departed from the CS assumption? Um, no. Uh, no. Um, I think, so remember that, so there, we have a lot of symmetry here in the model, right? So. Um, you know, a lot of what I've learned from your work and other people's work is um, if you think about heterogeneity and how trade affects markups or selection and things like that, these things can actually matter a big deal. Um, you know this, but you, you're better equipped to answer this question than I am. I'm less sure with full symmetry how, what could go wrong here, uh, maybe. There's some stuff that could go wrong, uh, but I'm, I'm a little bit less clear. Um, but if you have any sort of, if you think about it and have concerns, do let me know. Yeah, I mean, we would try to address them. But uh, certainly that's, you know, that, that'd be interesting to look at. Um, for trade volumes, I mean, quantitatively could be quite different for sure, but um, qualitatively I'm less clear. Great. We are nearly uh, out, out of time. Uh, so if people have further questions on or comments, please do type them in the Q&A box because we'll share with uh, Paul the transcripts uh, of, of the, um, the Q&A box. The slides and recording uh, of this session will be available shortly on the um, uh, seminar website, which is www.gtdw.ch, uh, where there's also the full schedule. And uh, you can see that our next meeting is on the 26th of October with another great speaker, Beata Jaborchik. Once more, Paul, thank you very, very much uh, for your great presentation and for joining us. And thanks, everyone, for participating. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. And just encourage again everybody to reach out if you have questions or concerns or anything, just uh, reach out. And thanks so much for doing this. This was uh, a lot of fun. I do hope 
to come visit sometime. I miss, uh, I miss Geneva. <laughs> it would be a pleasure to host you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks again. Let's give him a class. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs> right. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Paul. Bye-bye.